My name is Danny Jackson. Uh, I work with USDA. Uh, USDA sponsors the ADAPT program as part of our portfolio of programs in Afghanistan looking at uh, trying to rebuild the Afghan agricultural infrastructure and help uh, strengthen the Ministry of Agriculture in Afghanistan. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about a number of different things. We're going to start off talking just about generally about Afghanistan. We're going to talk about agricultural development and I'm going to talk to, with you a little bit about food security. Uh, so we're going to cover those topics through the morning, but we're going to also take uh, some frequent breaks. If you have questions or issues or, or things you want to discuss, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Uh, just ask your questions and let's have this, as this is a small enough group, we can have a good conversation. I'd rather have conversations about the issues that are important to you where we can have, uh, we can make sure we touch on those things and bring out the experience that some of us have uh, in Afghanistan. There's a number of resource people that are going to be in and out through the week that you'll be able to, to talk with. Um, i tell you a little bit about myself. I'm an extension person by training and by experience primarily. I worked as a county agent in Mississippi. I've worked as a, a district director in state administration at Ohio State University and I was the associate dean and director of extension at Penn State University. Uh, so I've worked in three different universities working in uh, extension work primarily in the United States, but we've also, I've also done some work in a number of other countries. Uh, for the 2011 and 2012, I spent at the embassy in, uh, in Afghanistan and Kabul, and I was an embedded extension advisor to the Ministry of Agriculture, Irrigation, and Livestock uh, in Kabul. I did uh, get out into the country a little bit, not as much as many of our field ag advisors, but I've been to, uh, uh, let's say, Nangarhar province, Kunar, uh, up in uh, Balk and Mazar Sharif. I've been to Herat, uh, and then of course there around, around Kabul, uh, out in, in the field to the, some of the research farms and other things. Um, we work closely with a pretty big network. When I was there, we had about 65 staff in country. Uh, we had ag advisors spread across the country and a lot of the different uh, provincial reconstruction teams uh, working with both military, civilians, and NGOs and others working to uh, support agriculture in Afghanistan. Uh, so that's a little bit of my experience. Uh, how many of you have been, to, uh, been deployed to Afghanistan for a significant amount of time? Good number of you. Um, Plan to go. Some of you are, are going to be redeployed back to Afghanistan. I see your head shaking. Yep. Okay. Good. Uh, so you have some experience to draw on. So you know a little bit about, most of you know a little bit about what you're going to be going into. So hopefully we'll be able to supplement that with some good, more deep knowledge in agriculture so that you, uh, when you have issues that come up, you kind of understand some of the things that you may run into. Now, I worked with Danny Baring over there. I actually worked a little more with one of her colleagues who had the agriculture portfolio with uh, Sajidif when we were over there. So uh, we were next door neighbors from ISAF to the embassy, so we got to know each other a little bit. So uh, we've had a few people come through that we knew, so I look forward to getting to know some of you. Uh, so let's jump into the program. And again, please uh, ask questions. Uh, anything that you have questions about, the things you want to talk about, share your experiences. Uh, you're going to find that your classmates, you're going to learn as much from your classmates as you do from uh, the instructors probably. So uh, make this your class and let's just let's have a good time. Okay? All right. We're going to talk about agriculture in Afghanistan. Uh, and I'm going to try to follow along here so that I make sure and cover my topics I'm supposed to cover. Okay. <coughs> agriculture in Afghanistan is uh, extremely important economically, socially, and just about any way you can think of in Afghanistan. Uh, we're going to give you some statistics in a minute, but uh, 70 to 80 percent of the population in Afghanistan are involved, involved in agriculture in some way. Uh, 30 percent of the gross domestic product of Afghanistan comes from agriculture production and trade. So it is an extremely important part of the, agri of the economy. It's an extremely important part of the social fabric. Yes? Sorry, you said 70 percent? 70 percent of the population. You'll also see it 80 percent in some places. Uh, I tend to go to the 70% figure because there's been a lot of urbanization, a lot of people moving into the cities, working in uh, other parts of the economy in uh, larger places like Kabul, Jalalabad, Kandahar. How are the percentage in the city? 30. 30%. 30%. So we're, we're, we'll talk some more about that. Um, it uh, has a potential for increase in jobs and greater income uh, in, the, in this, the country. It has an opportunity to really uh, make a difference in providing for food for the country and, and it can be a real economic driver. Uh, it's an important aspect. Um, 
we're looking at a number of different things, including uh, how do we support the public sector. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this later, but the U.S. government's agricultural assistance strategy has two goals. One is to increase agricultural income and jobs, and the other is to uh, increase the Afghans' confidence in their government. The way we increase the confidence in their government in agriculture is by supporting and building the uh, Afghan Ministry of Agriculture, Irrigation, and Livestock so that it's effectively serving the Afghan population. Uh, if you think about, uh, what, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself too much, but uh, the, uh, the Minister of Agriculture in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan is quoted as saying, the agriculture will determine whether Afghanistan will succeed or fail. And it's such an important aspect of the economy and social fabric of that country that uh, I believe that is true. Okay, this may seem uh, obvious to most people, but uh, uh, I can give you example after example where we tried to take uh, U.S. solutions and apply them to Afghan problems, and they didn't work out very well. Uh, but just because something works in the United States and something works from our experience does not mean that it will work in Afghanistan. There are a number of things you need to consider there. Uh, the scale is much smaller. We're going to talk a little bit about farm size and compare that uh, to your knowledge about the United States, and you'll see it's a huge difference. Uh, technologies are, are very different. When you're going into a, a place where they may not have electricity or may not have dependable electricity, may not have transportation, may not have equipment, um, uh, there's a lot of things to think about that the technology issues may be important. A friend of mine from uh, Australia that I worked with in, uh, at the ministry, he used to talk about this country in Afghanistan really depends on animal traction. And you think about that, that's, that's either horse or oxen or human-drawn uh, implements to, uh, to move the earth or plant or harvest or whatever. It really depends on animals more than, more than machinery. There are places you're going to find where machinery is frequent, but uh, that isn't as a good example. But the big thing to think about is uh, make sure that we find Afghan solutions to Afghan problems. Uh, you may understand, you may look at solutions, but really look at the underlying problem, and you may be able to come up with a, uh, an appropriate technological solution for a problem uh, that uh, fits Afghanistan better. The, we're, you're going to hear a lot of those different examples through the week, so uh, you'll have opportunity to talk about some of those thing, things as simple as uh, cracking and shelling almonds can be uh, a pretty simple solution uh, to what may look like a complex problem. Okay, a little bit about uh, agriculture and the economy. 12% um, of the land in Afghanistan is arable, or what we call it arable, which is uh, what we would, you would think of as farm ground, areas that can be cultivated. 12%. It's a very small number. We're going to show you what that looks like in a second. Well, I said 70% of the rural population, 30% of the population is urban. Uh, I wonder, I haven't seen any updated figures. This is a 2011 estimate, but I know that there's a tremendous number of people in Afghanistan that have really moved to urban areas. So I don't know if this, this number is still accurate, uh, but it would be interesting to see some updated data. The average income in 2010 was estimated to be $900, that's $900 per capita. Uh, and that was a 2010 estimate. I've seen some new estimates from 2012 that had that figure all the way up to $1,000. That's less than $100 a month. Uh, gross domestic product by sector. These numbers have given you agriculture at 38%, uh, industrial at 24%, and service at 38%. So uh, this has an agriculture uh, GDP a little bit higher than what I quoted you earlier, but uh, we do know that there's been some, some shifts in uh, uh, gross domestic product. Workforce, and this is, gives you the 80% number, 80% of the population being involved in agriculture in some way, or, uh, either in production or, or uh, agribusiness, and then 10% in industrial, 10% in service. Uh, in the cities, that'll be switched around a good bit. Average monthly wage, this is something I want you to really comprehend and think about. Um, a professional in Afghanistan might make uh, $400, you know, a doctor, an attorney, something like that. That's $400 a month uh, uh, wage. Shopkeeper, about $250. They own their own shop. It's a busy shop. A farmer might make about $120 a month. And then a mail extension worker. And think about the mail extension worker as a typical government employee that works for the Ministry of Agriculture. 
uh, about $160. Now this is somebody typically with uh, advanced education, uh, maybe a bachelor's degree, uh, maybe at, le at least they would have uh, probably a, some training beyond high school, maybe a two-year technical degree, uh, or at the very least they would have graduated from an agricultural high school. So, but that's, when you think about the literacy level in Afghanistan, that's a pretty advanced education in many wages, places. Do the wages vary on what district they're in? Or the cost of working on it? Not, there's not a lot of variance among extension workers across the country in uh, what district they're in. There are some that uh, would have different level positions, uh, and that does vary somewhat. Uh, I've seen figures from range from 140 to $200 a month, uh, depending on a length of service and some of those kind of things. But uh, that's, uh, that's an important figure. And when you compare that figure to uh, an NGO employee with the same type of education, they may make, easily be making 10 times this amount, okay? So you have a certain dichotomy taking place there where you've had a lot of the government workers that worked in extension now shifted out and went into work uh, for the NGOs. Okay, so if you think about trying to run a ministry and all your best employees leave and go to the new employer that's paying 10 times as much, it's kind of hard to compete with that. So put yourself in a position of a manager and how you would run an organization like that where all your best people leave, um, or your most educated, your, your, the most ambitious people leave, makes it very difficult uh, to provide really good services through an organization that's having that kind of upheaval. So that gives you an idea of what the Ministry of Agriculture is facing. Um, now, what does, that's what 12% of the land looks like. So really, really a uh, small amount of the country is really uh, arable. If you look at uh, the, the light blue color, uh, primarily in the south, but a little bit across the north is irrigated land. That's land that has access to uh, 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 water from some of the different uh, canals and uh, irrigation systems. You'll see the, the green across the top is uh, rain fed. That's uh, there's little access to uh, irrigated irrigation, but uh, there is enough rainfall or enough snowfall that would allow them to have enough water to produce crop in most years. Uh, drought years, those uh, green areas are really uh, adversely affected. Uh, those are primarily growing wheat, and that wheat production numbers drop uh, dramatically when we see a drought in Afghanistan. So it's relatively small. If you look across the south, you're looking primarily around the, uh, the rivers and areas where they're able to uh, funnel water away. But this is an important aspect to think about for agriculture in Afghanistan. You also find that's also the uh, population centers. The people tend to congregate around the water. Okay. Average farm size in Afghanistan is one to five acres. So average farm size, and uh, I don't know what the average farm size of farms in California would be. I know uh, Pennsylvania, when I worked there, it was like 150 acres was the average farm size. That's average. You know, the more productive farms are much bigger. But this is the average farm size in Afghanistan, one to five acres. Relatively small, uh, and that's used to feed a family. Uh, produce uh, income for that family. It's pretty, sig uh, pretty significant uh, to think about get it, feeding a whole family off of one to five acres. Uh, it can be larger in parts of the country, especially in some areas in the south and along some of the larger uh, uh, waterways. Uh, I think you'll see some pretty large farms around Jalalabad. Uh, there's some pretty large farms in the south in Kandahar and, and Helmand provinces where you have a, a little broader plains, uh, broader uh, areas where uh, farm field size can be a little, a little larger. Um, really depends on the terrain and the water, and the, wa the available water. Uh, a jerib is a word you're going to hear, a jerib or a jerib, depending on how people pronounce that. Uh, it's typically about a half acre, the five jeribs in a hectare. Uh, a hectare is about two and a half acres. Uh, if you want to think of it that way, it's a metric uh, measure of, of the area of land, but that's, they really are, uh, you hear anybody talking about land size in Afghanistan, you'll hear them talk about the number of jerubs. Okay? Going back to that one to five acres, I mean, one acre, I mean, that's like a garden. I mean, is that the, the $125 you were saying that a farmer earns a month? Is that based on that size? It, that's, yes. Just making enough to feed the 
Yeah, that's now we're talking averages. Yeah, that's you're gonna have some some variance up and down. But yeah, you wanna think about that $125 a month because they're gonna produce that much off of one to five acres. Okay. So they if you think about those farms, they're pretty intensively managed if you're going to produce that kind of money on an average over the year. Now, you also have to remember that farming is a very seasonal thing. So you have, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the low season or the, the time from basically from fall into uh, planting season or harvest for wheat the next spring uh, is going to be the low season or the season when they don't have very many resources. Uh, in the summertime will be the high season when they have more, more income, more resources. Uh, but yeah, that's typically from products that are marketed uh, across uh, uh, through the growing season. Summertime they have a lot more income, wintertime they have a lot less. Okay. Get into uh, some other things here. The crop calendar is something I can't overemphasize the importance to you. If I'm in your way, let me know. Okay. Um, crop calendar is an extremely important concept for somebody that's going to be working with people that are working in agriculture. Okay. Uh, it's uh, th there are certain times of the year when you're with planting season, harvest season, cultivation for different crops, and that changes. And you need to understand if you're working in one province or another, that cropping system will change. Uh, and this is just an example of national. We're going to show you some of the differences by province a little later. But the big thing I want you to understand is that you have, uh, uh, a, you know, there's, a, there's a planting season, there's land preparation, planting, weeding, and harvesting uh, through the season. And then, uh, but I want, let's see, if you look at uh, peak rains, peak snow, lean season, et cetera, and then your spring crop is uh, probably your, your wheat crop. Uh, some of the, the wheat will be planted in the fall it's in the ground over the winter. They typically grow winter wheat in Afghanistan. And then you would have harvest through uh, May, June, and July, with the heaviest harvest time probably being in May. Okay? So a question, how does that impact other programs that you might be involved in? Suppose you wanted to have a women's health shura in the middle of May, and you wanted to get good attendance. What impact is this crop calendar going to have on that, that program? the middle of harvest season of wheat, which is one of their most important, well, the most important crop in Afghanistan is wheat. And when you're in harvest season, it takes everybody to support that effort. Because wheat is typically harvested by hand. Uh, it's hand cut, hand threshed. Uh, and so it's, it's an extremely important labor intensive time. So. If you want to plan something at a time that you're having the middle of the wheat harvest season, uh, it's going to be very difficult to get participation. So those are some variables that you, you need to think about whether you're involved in agriculture or not. Uh, they're just some things that you can't, you have to work around uh, because many of these farmers are really subsistence farmers. If they don't do this work, their family does not eat for the rest of the year. So it's a survival thing for many of them. Okay, and we're gonna, you're going to hear a lot more about crop calendars as we as we go forward. Okay, the typical Afghan farmer, and this from my example, this is pretty accurate. They have a family household of eight to thirteen people, so a lot of mouths to feed on that one to five acres we were talking about. Uh, Twenty years experience in farming with uh, no education or very little education. Most of them are are illiterate, uh, so that would, that would create, that, you know what problems that creates. They don't own a tractor or any harvesting equipment. Does not mean they don't have access to some, uh, but they don't own any. There may be one person in a village that has access to a tractor, or one person, or they may have access to a thresher, or uh, something like that, but uh, they typically will not own one. They produce wheat as their main source of food. Uh, wheat is their staple crop. Bread would be the staple food. Uh, the, the wheat is uh, stored, kept through the winter, so that they, they have bread uh, to feed the family throughout the year. And bre bread is a, is a huge part of the Afghan diet. Uh, and it's, it's something that's easy to store. They're easy, able to produce bread throughout the year uh, from stored grain and that's ground and made into flour. 
Um, vegetable production is used for personal use uh, during the harvest season and then to supplement income uh, from, from the farm. Uh, vegetable crops have become a pretty important crop for many, many farms. Uh, getting to market, we're going to talk, you're going to hear a lot more about that this year, but getting that to market at the right time can be the difference between you know, a pretty significant profit or a loss on those. those. Fruit production, most uh, farms are, most will have a few fruit trees. Uh, they will have them for their own family's consumption, and then they sell the excess. Uh, you'll find some farms that have enough planted uh, that they will have a pretty significant amount of fruit to sell. Uh, over the last 10 years, we've pr planted a lot of fruit trees in Afghanistan. A lot of those are coming into production. So there's a lot more fruit on the market, a lot more uh, fruit for them to be able to sell, uh, looking more and more at uh, processing those fruits into juices or jams or dried fruits for uh, per, uh, consumption throughout the year to extend that season and to, uh, to export. They typically also own some livestock. Uh, just about, uh, if, they're gonna, if a farm owns livestock, they're, they're going to have sheep and goats. That's almost a given. Uh, the mace, you may see a donkey, you may see chickens, um, may see a, a few cattle in some places uh, for primarily for dairy production or for uh, uh, for meat and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that but the, uh, the Afghans will really keep livestock as a bank account in some ways because that's something that they can always sell and if they need some money at a certain time they'll put their money into livestock instead of, instead of a bank. Um, most farmers can't read. Uh, knowledge is passed down from father to son. When you have a country that's been involved in war for the last 30 years, there's a disruption in that chain of, of knowledge, uh, how that knowledge is passed down. Uh, many of the fathers, uncles, uh, grandparents may have uh, passed away, uh, or may have, some of them may have moved away, but there's a, there is a disruption in that passing down of knowledge. You'll find many situations where uh, a young boy, 12, 13 years old, is actually would be considered the farmer of a, of a home farm. Uh, may have some support from some elders or uncles or something like that uh, nearby, but uh, sometimes you, that's not an uncommon thing to find. Um, this picture is, uh, I want to show you, is a typical Afghan farm. Um, it's a little hard, maybe a little hard for you to see. Um, you may be able to see it on your, uh, your handouts there. But if you look at the farm, you'll see, the uh, uh, best way for me to do this is probably point it out. You see this around the outside? That's uh, wheat that's recently been harvested. Uh, wheat straw is still there. Uh, typically that wheat straw will be used. Uh, it won't be wasted. It'll be used either for livestock feed through the winter uh, or for lots of other different purposes that they'll use, uh, use that for. Uh, the field here in the center, uh, this, you don't know this, but this is uh, onions uh, that have been planted there uh, for, for the family. That's a pretty good sized field of, of, of onions. Um, you'll see that this is the house area and the, you know, the compound around the house. These are fruit trees that are growing. This is in Helmand province. Uh, the fruit trees around the house, it's pretty typical that the fruit trees would be around that area. Uh, you can't see this very well, but this area right here is planted in poppy, uh, which is pretty common in Helmand province. Um, the thing that, the couple of things I want you to pick up from that is uh, an agricultural enterprise, even on a small farm, one to five acres, is a pretty diverse operation. They have a number of different crops growing there. They don't put all their eggs in one basket because they can't afford to have a crop failure if they're in a Mon what we would call monoculture here. You know, you may see farmers here in, in the United States that'll plant everything in corn and soybeans. You know, from fence row to fence row, they'll plant corn and soybeans. Well, if, for an, in an, on an Afghan farm, when you're trying to uh, grow food and, and raise money for your family that you're really on a subsistence level, you can't afford to have a crop failure in one of those or the other uh, because that means your, your family may not have the food it needs to get through the winter. So. Uh, you'll find that many Afghan farmers are very risk averse because of that. They don't want, they, they can't afford to take some of the risks that we see farmers taking in the United States. There's no crop insurance for a crop failure in Afghanistan. So that means that your kids go hungry, 
and may not make it through the winter. Okay? Oops, wrong way. Uh, agriculture value chains are, is an important concept that uh, you, you intuitively know this from uh, living in the United States. You see crops, you know that they're grown in some places, transported to another, sold in supermarkets, etc. What we want you to think about is what that value chain looks like in Afghanistan. And uh, we, we often have the assumption in the United States that we can make one input change here and it'll have an impact on that crop all the way through. That may not be true in Afghanistan because you may not have the markets to support the recapturing of value from that input. Uh, you may not have the markets, you may not have the uh, processing facilities, you may not have the inputs to be able to put extra fertilizer on a crop or uh, have improved seed. So those are challenges. Um, but a value chain links the steps that a product takes from farmer to the market. And we're talking about from the inputs all the way to the consumption by the consumer. Okay? So that's what we're talking about when we talk about value chain. A lot of our efforts in Afghanistan are looking at how do we improve value chains. And it may, not, may be working at the farmer level or it may be working at the market level. You may be, need to bring brokers into that market so that they, there are people there to buy uh, those products once they're produced. For example, we planted a lot of pomegranates in Afghanistan. If we're not careful in developing that value chain, all those pomegranates are come, going to come into the market at the same time. If there's no opportunity to market those and move those products to other areas where there may be markets for them, uh, the price of pomegranates is going to fall to the floor. The pomegranates are going to rot in the fields. Uh, so if you, you have to make sure that you have proper uh, storage, markets, uh, transportation, uh, processing where it's appropriate. All of these are parts of the value chain. It includes everything from research and development, uh, input suppliers, production, storage, transportation, processing, packaging, marketing, and finance. All of these uh, individually uh, need to be present to have an effective uh, working value chain. Uh, in Afghanistan, some places you'll find the value chains working very well. Some places you'll find value chains that may be broken simply by having one link in this chain that's not working effectively. If you can fix that one link in the chain, uh, you can have a great impact on uh, the Afghan farmers and the whole Afghan communities. But value, if you think about the reason we call it a value chain, value is added at each one of these steps. Uh, it's not about getting all the money back to the farmers because the input suppliers have to make money too. So uh, I'll give you an example of some of our attempts to do good in Afghanistan. If we come into a community and provide them with uh, seed and fertilizer for all their wheat for a year, we've really helped those farmers out because they, they didn't have to buy wheat, didn't have to buy fertilizer. Uh, they planted, they may have an improved wheat, they're going to have a great crop that year. But what did we do to the value chain? That was a question. What did we do the va to the value chain? I want you to think about the cause and effect relationship. Well, you increase the crop, right? Right. We increase the crop. We help the farmers out. Right. Well, put more money in put more money in the pockets of those farmers. Well, yeah, they don't yeah, they traditionally it's gonna lower the price because you have all this wheat they gotta sell and you have the same amount of wheat you're selling. Potentially. Yeah, the price is gonna go down. Others? My concern is not for this year, my concern is next year. What did you do to the businesses of all those input suppliers that sell those farmers seed and fertilizer? You put them out of business. You kill the value chain for next year. You may have helped the farmers this year, but you probably made input supplies very difficult for them to get access to unless some donor comes along and gives them to them again the next year. And then you haven't really created a valuable chain that is going to help those farmers in the long run. We've done a lot of giving away things with the right intentions, but we have done uh, harm in many of those cases. So before you go giving things away, think about what impact it's going to have on that whole value chain. You may help your target, which is maybe the farmers, but you may have a negative impact on the whole value chain. Uh, you may be better off in trying to find a way to get lower cost 
products to that input supplier, linking them to a, to a source. Yeah. So it's like the governor of uh, Afghanistan, do they have like a, a goal for example, he's going to grow, or they want, they want to grow so many uh, acres of wheat throughout, or they, they don't want you to grow any more than that, or do they, what is their national strategy on that? So they can go on into those situations. Um, the go the, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this through the week, but just I'll go ahead and answer that question. Uh, Afghanistan is a, is a uh, wheat deficit country, and wheat is by far their largest product. They import food into Afghanistan uh, most of the year, uh, particularly in wintertime. Uh, so it is a, it's a food deficit country. It needs food from outside to be able to support itself. So there are no crop controls in limiting production. Uh, the goal is to increase production. The real challenge is in, in uh, allocating water, which you want to talk a little bit more about. But uh, we, uh, the goal in Afghanistan is to produce more food so that you can feed the population. As the population increases, that demand on food is going to increase too. So uh, we're going to talk about production of wheat in particular uh, because wheat being the stable crop in Afghanistan, uh, you'll see some of those figures. But yeah, we want to produce more and more food in Afghanistan. There are times when markets go up and down simply because everything, you know, all of the bell peppers hit the market at the same time. All of the, the peaches hit the market at the same time. Local markets have, uh, you know, ups and downs uh, throughout the year. Um, but if you can spread that out, like, for example, things come out of the market in Jalalabad a lot faster, uh, come onto the market a lot faster in Jalalabad than they do in Kabul. So if you can move some of those products to Kabul, uh, Mazar, or other places, then you, you can spread that season out a little bit. Okay. Other questions? Uh, we're going to talk a little more about value chains here. This is a graphical representation of a value chain. Uh, you think about inputs, you're talking about things like machinery, equipment, feed, seed, fertilizer, uh, technology. You know, advanced seeds are an important technological innovation. Uh, UG99 resistant seed. I know many of you don't know what UG99 is, but it's a rust disease or fungus disease on wheat. And uh, it is a, it's an international problem, and their uh, strong effort is to keep UG99 out of Afghanistan as much as possible. So they would like to see UG99 resistant seed as much as possible. Uh, so that's a technology innovation. Then it goes to the farmers. Farmers use those inputs to produce their crop, then they market that. They may market through a cooperative, and there's a, there's a number of very effective working cooperatives in Afghanistan, or they may uh, work directly with buyers. Those buyers then may move that into processing and uh, uh, food, fiber, industrial products, a number of different things that could be, can be done from, made from agricultural products. Industrial products are things like cotton, if you want to think about uh, what might fit in that, in that area. Uh, you will also find farmers that will add value along that value chain. They may group, work with a group of uh, farmers or a cooperative to process their products in at one stage or a second stage that will add some value into it in processing before it goes to market or before it goes to the consumer. Um, that's one of the things we teach farmers. You can add value to your product by processing it a little bit. Packaging, sorting, uh, some very simple things that you can do to add value to a product. Uh, and many farmers in Afghanistan, they will just take up whatever they produce and put it on the market and sell it all together. Uh, one of the things that we've tried to teach is uh, by sorting and grading, uh, you can have differentiate your products into higher value products and lower value products. Uh, so that you may have some that you want to ship out and get a higher value for, some you may want to sell locally, uh, lower grade. And then it goes to the consumers, restaurants, uh, some of it goes to export, clothing, construction, however those products are used. Um, the, on the base of that, you need to have research. You need to know what the answer to some of the questions and problems are. Uh, you need to have a good credit and financing system. Sorry you can't see the slide very good. We'll work on that. But uh, credit and finance system, financing system in Afghanistan is really a challenge. Uh, we're going to talk some more about that credit as we go forward. But uh, it's, you don't just go to the bank and get a loan in Afghanistan. You know, many of you know that uh, charging interest is not Sharia law compliant. They have developed some products through the banking system uh, that would allow them to, to make loans, and there are some government-sponsored loans to farmers and cooperatives as well, which we'll talk a little bit more about through the week. And then the bottom is where uh, 
actions of the government may have an impact on the agricultural value chain. Those would be things like uh, policy, like price supports, insurance, food safety, uh, farm inputs, uh, uh, improved seed, uh, certified seed. Uh, a lot of times the government will have different programs to, like, well, a good example is they want to get more and more certified seed into the market and they want farmers to then reproduce that seed, save it for the next year, share it with their neighbors, sell it as an improved variety. Uh, it may be drought-resistant seeds, it may be higher producing uh, seeds, it may be seeds that are resistant to UG99. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of improved seed that they could be using. Uh, but those are all areas where uh, policy or, or actions by the government can have an impact. Uh, some things we didn't talk about is other outside forces. Um, NGOs that have, uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars from donors that they need to spread across the country in different ways and giving away products can have an impact. Uh, giving away equipment, tractors, those kind of things can all have an impact on that value chain. Some positive, some negative. So. Okay. The big thing I want you to walk away from uh, with value chains is understanding that one weak link or one broken link in that value chain can disrupt the whole system. It doesn't matter how much wheat you produce or how much of a vegetable or, or a fruit you produce, if you don't have a market for that, uh, the value chain is broken. It doesn't matter how much water you have, if you can't get seed and fertilizer to plant your wheat at, at the right time, uh, it's going to have an impact. Uh, some, give some good examples of late seed getting to farmers. Uh, for planting of uh, planting of wheat can make a uh, if you plant wheat a couple of a couple of weeks after the ideal time on average uh, you're going to have a big disruption in the amount of wheat produced uh, wheat produced for that year is going to be going to drop dramatically so timing is very important making sure things get to the market at the right time Our, um, so. Can you get somebody give me an example of, uh, of a value chain, of a crop? And we'll, then we'll talk through that value chain just uh, uh, quickly. What's in, somebody give me an example. Pomegranates? I heard somebody say, okay. Uh, what do you need to produce pomegranates? A lot of water? Some water. Not, not a tremendous amount, but yeah, they're... Uh, but they are fruit tree, they're producing, they need water at the right times, etc. What else? Seeds. Excuse me? Seeds. Seeds? Well, actually, pomegranates, you're planting a, a sapling or a, a, a tree. So it's going to take a few years to get there, so you need time. Time is something, and you've got to keep those trees alive up until the time they do produce. Maybe a little fertilizer uh, for, for those, yes, they need nutrients to grow. You need a market to grow. What's that? A market to grow. A market, absolutely. You've got to have a market, a place to sell them once they start producing. Transportation to their market? What, Dan? Transportation. Transportation. You've got to get it to the market. See, these are, these are all important pieces. Uh, where am I going to get the trees? Storage. Storage is another. But where, where, back up a little bit. Where am I going to get the trees to plant? <laughs> USA, yep. but the trees are actually going to come from, there, there are actually nurseries producing trees in Afghanistan. There's a very effective nursery association uh, nationwide that produces fruit trees and other things for farmers, uh, for input, for farmers to be able to sell. That, that's an effective industry that's working, working well. Um, so there is a source. Can I get them locally? Is there a local supplier? Those are things you have to ask. Uh, suppose I'm going to transport. How do we transport pomegranates? What? The jingle trucks. Jingle trucks. Before they get to the jingle truck, wheelbarrows. Maybe. Wheelbarrows is a common way to transport them. Uh, you know, if you put them in a jingle truck, do you just pile them in on top of each other? You see that happen, but maybe there's a better way to produce. Maybe they need boxes to put them in, some, some kinds of inputs to help preserve the quality of them until they get where they're going. Um, pomegranates, 
like many fruit trees are, as soon as you pick that plant, it starts to die. As soon as you pick that fruit off the tree, it starts to die. What can you do to keep that, to slow that process down? Cool storage. Cool storage. Cool storage. That's the right word, not cold storage. Yeah, you, we're gonna, you're going to hear people talk about cold storage and cool storage. Uh, if you have a broken chain of cold storage, that fruit will, will start to deteriorate quicker. But cool storage, you know, getting the farmers to understand to pick the fruit in the morning or late afternoon, store it in a cool place until you take it to market, you know, transport it in the cool part of the day, cooler part of the day. Those are all important parts. And th that knowledge is the technology that goes into that value chain. So you can understand some, some pretty good examples there. That's, that's a pretty good local one. Uh, let's go to another one that always is popular uh, when we do this class. Let's talk about the opium value chain. That's a value chain that's well defined. It works well. It has worked for hundreds of years. Why does that value chain work? And it's the fruit one we talked about is really a local value chain. Uh, let's talk about opium as a, a regional value chain. So think about this. Why does the opium value chain work? What does it look like? What? There's, There's a high demand for their product. <laughs> All right, uh, so speak up. Richard. Global market. Good mar it's global market. Glo it's a global market. Yeah, very much so. So it's a very big market. Government support. I mean, ghetto government supports. And then obviously the government's kind of turning, I wouldn't say a blind eye to it, but taking it to the side. Yeah. Giving them some kind of impunity to, to operate in Why do you think that happens? <laughs> what? I can't, I can't hear you, sir. The income is a tremendous amount of money in that market. It's, it's uh, economically, it's more important to keep the product going to market than it is to stop it. The, the alternative is not there to displace it from production. What else? Easily stored, long, long life. Easily stored, long life. It's stored, you know, in a small brick. Uh, um, you know, they make them in, into small bricks. Is basically what they put that re put the resin into. You can store it under a bed. You can store it in a, you know, somewhere for you know a long period of time. It really is not going to going to damage it. And it's a form of money, like a savings. Right. It can be a form of money. It's e easily traded. Um, so we we talk about different aspects of it. You think about what does that mean? What that means as a part of the value chain. If I'm a farmer, these are things that are attractive to me, so there's some reasons why we produce it. But back to the value chain part of it. Uh, where does a farmer get the financing and the inputs to plant opium on an annual basis? Yes, where do they get, where do they get, where do I get poppy seed from? It's not the ones that go to my muffins around here, is it? So. Right. 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 From where? From landowners. Like whoever they're getting their ability to have their land. You know, they bought the land, but they have to pay that land back. The only way they can pay it is by producing poppy so that they can keep it. Yeah, so you're saying the person that sold them the land may actually be the person financing. Could be. Could be. Yeah, Taliban get blamed for everything bad that happens. So we know they do everything. So, uh, what else? Okay. Uh, let's think. Of, uh, there is a very well-defined system of warlords and drug lords, and you know you can use all kinds of names. The Taliban is certainly involved. So, Taliban is certainly a key part of uh, using uh, poppy as an income source to support what they're trying to do. But there are many, many others too. That there are, it's just too lucrative an international business. Uh, there's too many people making money off of it. So there is a well-defined financing system. There's a well-defined input system. It operates, it gets and serves those farmers. There, farmers can work with this, with these uh, 
consortium or, or these uh, drug boards, whatever you want to call them, uh, to get the financing, they can get the seed, they can get the inputs, and get the fertilizer, or they may get cash in order to do that, and then they don't have to pay it back until the crop comes in. So essentially, they have served in a contracting role. Uh, the pe they're going to buy the poppy. Many times, their poppy is a very labor-intensive crop. If you don't have the labor, uh, the person that's going to buy the poppy will make sure that they get the labor in for you. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people that are coming into some of these areas uh, harvesting poppy uh, when it comes time to harvest. So uh, then there is uh, processing, uh, transportation system. You know, oftentimes you know, a farmer can just sit at home and the transportation system will come to them to transport the product. Uh, farmers can keep a little bit of it for a bank account. There's just so many attractive parts. It's shipped out, processed, sold on an international market. Uh, it's a pretty efficient system. Uh, there is high risk involved, uh, but it is an, an efficient and effective value chain system. Uh, and what we do when we try to disrupt that is we will try to attack that value chain in one place or another to break that chain so it doesn't work anymore. We don't try to really break the whole value chain. We'll look at one part of it we want to break. So. That gives you an example of a value chain you want to disrupt versus a value chain that we want to support and improve. Okay? Uh, we want to improve and support the value chain for wheat, but we want to see the value chain for a poppy disrupted. Same, same uh, concept of looking at the value chain and having ways to improve or impact that, uh, but used for different purposes. One used to support the value chain and help the economic production on one side. Uh, the other side is to try to disrupt that, make producing poppy much more risky than it would be to produce something else, an alternative. You're going to hear Gary Kuhn this afternoon talk about uh, alternative crops to poppy, and there are alternative crops to poppy that may be just as economically viable. You have to ask yourself, why aren't farmers producing those other crops if those options are there? So you have to put yourself in the mindset of an Afghan farmer and ask those questions. And, de and uh, you will find different answers to some of those questions in different places depending on where you are in Afghanistan. Uh, let's get started and talk a little bit about uh, fruit and vegetable production in Afghanistan. Uh, dried fruits and nuts in Afghanistan are really historically known for their quality. Uh, regionally, uh, India, Pakistan, and other areas, uh, Afghan products and fruits and dried fruits and nuts are really uh, coveted. Uh, uh, traditionally across that region, they, they command a premium in the markets in some of those places. Uh, so it's, there is an opportunity to take advantage of some things and some, some historical reputation there. Uh, it's a, how there are challenges with that in the global market, looking at uh, global competitors, uh, looking at uh, uh, food safety standards, uh, handling standards, uh, some of those kinds of things Afghanistan has fallen behind on. Uh, so making sure that we have, uh, have quality uh, products to export is, uh, is an extremely important aspect. Making sure that they have good testing and uh, monitoring systems for their sanitary and phytosanitary efforts. Uh, food safety, uh, ensuring that their products are good is, is an important part. Um, there are some specialty crops, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about. But uh, think about fruits and vegetables. Most of it is produced for home markets. Uh, our home consumption in local markets. Uh, there are many larger producers, especially in the south, uh, Kandahar and some in the Helmand Valley, uh, some areas around Nangahar. Uh, there's a lot of great production in those uh, provinces around Kabul. Uh, and so there's, there's different regions that have uh, specialized in other, pr other products. Um, the dried fruits and nuts uh, exported are things like raisins, almonds, dried apricots, and pistachios. Uh, those are the ones that we see most common. The dried apricots are uh, pretty popular all over. Uh, some potential for regional exports of things like pomegranates, melons, potatoes, onions. Uh, there's some real opportunity for export markets, we believe, in those areas. Uh, there's been a lot of, of uh, uh, progress made in exporting some of these, especially things like uh, apricots. Uh, Gary Kuhn will talk to you this afternoon about some of the success that Roots of Pieces had with uh, exporting uh, fresh fruit. Uh, so that's been an interesting development in the last couple of years. Uh, so that's something to keep an eye on. Especially crops uh, that are produced in different areas, uh, saffron and harat and citrus in Nangahar. 
Uh, you also see citrus and kunar, uh, some of those areas where in the valleys where they have uh, weather that's conducive to that. Uh, a lot of uh, citrus produced there that much of it's exported. Uh, so that's a, a crop that has some real potential in the areas where it can be grown. It's an interesting phenomenon. Yes? Excuse me, a crop that what? A lot of people think that. Um, uh, but, well, there are some reasons why it does not compete with, uh, with opium. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but, yeah, saffron is a specialty crop that's extremely high value. It's been, been effective around Herat. Uh, not so effective in the south and not so effective in the east. Uh, we, there's been a, some planted by the ministry uh, in uh, Nangahar, Kunar, some other provinces there. There's been some planted in the south. Uh, it's not been as successful. It's not as well adapted to some of those climates as you would find in Herat and uh, some places like that. But um, it's, uh, a, it, saffron is a product that needs uh, a real well-developed value chain. It needs uh, trained workers to process it, produce it, sort it. Uh, those kinds of things, and it's not a traditional crop, so it takes a lot of effort to get, get going. It also uh, grows differently than poppy. Uh, it's a multi-year crop, grown from bulbs or planted in the ground, so poppy is an annual crop, so it can be moved around from field to field. Um, it also grows off-cycle a little bit time-wise, so if you really wanted high-value crops, you plant poppy it's to grow in its certain time, you plant saffron to grow at its time. Both of them are, are labor intense. If you've got a large family, you can do both in theory. Uh, so, it, But it doesn't compete directly. That's a, a challenge that it has. How many of you know what saffron is? Yeah, you know, I'll know that a lot of people are familiar with it. If you've been in Afghanistan, you probably had saffron sea, tea. You see it sold at the airports, uh, a lot of different places. It's basically uh, the stamens out of a flower. Uh, and they're, they're red bright colors. Um, there's a great demand for it on the open market uh, internationally. Uh, we've had producers in the United States say they would take all we could send of a certain quality level. That can sometimes be a challenge. Uh, it's training people growing a new crop. How do they do this when you may only produce a couple of kilograms on an acre? And a, but a couple of kilograms can be a lot of financially, so it's a small product. Uh, You've got, got to be handled correctly, it's got to be taken care of. Uh, if it's not, the value of that crop, crop can go down in a hurry. But those are some, those are some specialty crops. Okay, questions about fruits and vegetables? Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, livestock production. Livestock's in a really important crop to uh, the economy in Afghanistan is important to farmers. Um, it forms a, a main source of the household economy in many rural areas. Uh, you'll also see, we'll talk a little bit about coochies. Uh, how many of you ever heard of coochies? Right, coochies are nomadic tribes uh, in Afghanistan. They really are built around raising livestock and moving those livestock from place to place, from grazing area to grazing area. Uh, it's been estimated they produce about 70% of the protein production by meat in Afghanistan. So really significant <laughs> population of people, and they are also a very important part of the Afghan economy, uh, the agricultural economy especially. Um, they produce uh, uh, forage and feed supplies are a big constraint uh, because Afghans typically have not produced crops to feed livestock. That's what grazing is for. Uh, they will have roughage things like uh, wheat stalks, uh, those kinds of things in the wintertime uh, to feed the animals. Not a lot of nutrition value in that, so there's a lot of uh, feast and famine. You know, when it's springtime and the rains are coming, there's a lot of grazing there for the animals. Uh, they grow, they do well, that's their reproduction times when the calves are born, when the uh, lambs are born, that time of year, there's plenty to eat. Uh, but that's uh, quite a challenge. It's estimated about three million Coochie nomads but there's, they do put a lot of stress on rangeland and rangeland capacity. Uh, when the, when the, uh, you have the flush of the green crops and green grasses and the other plants in the springtime, they can be heavily grazed by uh, those Coochie tribes. They do move and continue to go up. 
up the mountains in the, in the summertime and back down in the, uh, in the winter. Uh, typically will winter in the lower valleys where it's warmer. Uh, and then they'll go up the, up the mountains in the, in the summertime following the grasses. Um, the livestock all across Afghanistan lacks quality uh, veterinary services. Um, the DCA, or what we known as the Dutch Committee for Afghanistan, have done a tremendous job building a program called a Paravet program. Uh, the Paravets are, are people who have uh, some training in caring for animals and caring for livestock. They typically have a motorcycle and a vet kit on the back of their motorcycle and they can go from village to village to village uh, selling their veterinary services. A lot of uh, uh, vaccination, a lot of treatment of diseases, a lot of uh, treatment of uh, uh, parasites and those kind of things are done by those groups. Uh, looks like that program is going to be successful. Uh, number, they have trained, they've trained about six, seven hundred of those in total. I think uh, the last numbers I heard is about 300, 350 that are actively uh, working in Afghanistan. Uh, there are a few vets in Afghanistan that uh, kind of support that effort, but yeah, it's an important uh, resource that they've not had access to. Uh, and uh, it's been a, most farmers that I've heard about that interacted with the Paravet program have been able to see value of that pretty quickly because those vets are able to add a lot of value, keeping animals alive, making them well, keeping their herds healthy. Uh, but there's still a lot of knowledge that's not known by uh, those uh, coochie nomads or other farmers who have livestock about how to care for livestock, what are the reproduction cycles, uh, how do you uh, do preventive medicine, uh, just basic herd health kinds of things that are, are important uh, technologies that they don't have ac haven't had access to. Um, so there's not very much knowledge about nutrition uh, and understanding that you need to keep nutrition levels up for those animals all through the year, and especially during times when their uh, uh, young ones are being born and they're, they're lactating, feeding those young ones. Uh, some basic things that if, if the farmers knew, they could do a much better job of managing their resources. Okay? This one is always of interest to a lot of people. We've talked a lot about it. This is there's some really up-to-date uh, values here so you know kind of what uh, what's happening in the poppy production up to uh, 2012 uh, that crop year uh, estimated this these are uh, in intelligence figures that Afghanistan produced 4300 metric tons of uh, opium in 2012 there were approximately 180,000 hectares of uh, poppy produced in 18 provinces, and Helmand alone had half that. So Helmand is uh, by far the heaviest producing province in Afghanistan of poppy. Um, 80, 180,000 hectares of five gerbs in a hectare, so if you think about uh, how many farms that would take to produce that much, knowing that a farm may be one to five acres and uh, they're only going to have a small amount, so there's a lot of farms involved. 2011, Afghanistan produced roughly 85% of the global uh, supply of illicit opium. Who produces the illicit opium? Is there legal production of opium anywhere in the world? Turkey. Where? Turkey. Turkey? Another? Australia? Produces a lot. Uh, number, a few countries do produce illicit opium for production of pharmaceuticals. Uh, Afghanistan is not one of those. The, Af the opium produced in Afghanistan is illicit. What, what happened to that one program that they tried to push like, poppies for medicine? I'm not familiar with that program, uh, Danny. I know I've heard it discussed is why don't we make it illicit crop and, and regulate it and <laughs> be able to, to operate it that way. But um, you know, I, I, I can imagine what impact that would have on the illicit opium production market worldwide. But uh, it is, it's, it's an idea that's been, certainly been discussed in Afghanistan. You said there, were, there must have been a program pushing that. Maybe, yeah, never came to fruition. No, yeah, I, I heard the idea discussed, but I did not hear of a program that was really trying to move that forward. Um, the value of the farm gate, $1.4 billion in 2011. Uh, you think about... Uh, the number of dollars that is and what the gross domestic product of Afghanistan in total is, it's pretty significant. 
What yeah. does that mean, farm gate value? That's uh, how much the farmers get when the product leaves their farm gate. Okay. That's what the farmer gets. And it's not, the, not processing, not uh, the part of transportation, the other, other parts of the value chain that are added. That's the part that the farmer collects at the farm gate. Opium prices uh, since 2010, uh, let's see, opium prices around $200 a kilogram since 2010. That was compared to less than $100 a kilogram in 2008-2009. Uh, and you see the price had gone up. Uh, there were a number of variables involved there. There were some, uh, uh, well, with, there's, there's so many, there's different variables involved in production of poppy. Uh, poppy production a few years ago dropped dramatically. And everybody said, yay, we're having success. Well, if you get a sociologist and somebody that really understands or an anthropologist that understands what's going on with the population, if you know that the wheat price almost doubled, or well, the worldwide wheat price almost doubled, so farmers are going to have to pay more for their wheat, what did farmers do? They planted more wheat so they wouldn't have to uh, go on the market for, for that. So that pushed poppy off their farms a little bit. So it reduced the amount of poppy produced. But if I'm a farmer, I want to make sure my family is fed first income comes second. So if I know that the market for wheat is really, really high and I'm not going to have, I may or may not have the cash to buy that wheat on the open market to feed my family when our wheat supplies run out, then I'm going to plant some extra wheat so we have extra wheat as an insurance policy. So those are some things that happen. Um, crop calendar, understand poppies planted from October 1st to December 1st in most provinces. Uh, depending on where you are, maybe earlier or later, uh, but really in that window is basically where it happens. Uh, what else? Well, we're going to talk about some other crop calendars, but look at the wheat crop calendar, compare that to, to poppy. Uh, the main opium harvest takes place in April and May, depending on the province. Uh, Saffron is going to be much later, uh, as an example. Vegetables are going to be much later. Uh, so harvest time, it's not competing with some of their other crops. That's make, that makes it a challenge in looking at alternative crops because it, it doesn't really compete. Opium is harvested by hand requires hundreds of thousands of seasonal laborers. Where do those laborers come from? Many of them are local. Many of them are brought in uh, as seasonal workers. If you think about uh, many agricultural products uh, in the United States, you'll have a regional, uh, you'll have uh, workers that'll move with that crop as it moves from being harvested in the south first and moving north. A lot of times those laborers will move north. Same thing happens in Afghanistan. They move with the crop. Um, opium can be easily stored, transported, and has a shelf life of many years. So if a farmer anticipates uh, daughters getting married, those kinds of things coming up, they can store that for a number of years uh, and it really won't lose any value. Some people say that the ac value actually goes up because it, uh, it after it's been sitting, uh, it actually gets better over time. Uh, USDA and our products, we do not work directly on counter-narcotics issues. We do, we do not work on poppy eradication, disrupting the value chain, et cetera. Uh, the work that we do is really to help farmers increase uh, income from their farm from licit crops. Uh, and looking at, uh, we're really not out going after uh, poppy production in, in our role. Uh, Poppy production is a, a real challenge. Um, uh, dealing with that, there's really no silver bullet that's going to impact that. I think if there were, we would have found that 10 years ago. Uh, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be that poppy's been produced in this region for thousands of years, and it will continue to be produced as, as, for a long time. We, we may have some impact on it, but it's, it's very much a part of the culture in Afghanistan. It's used by the families that produce it. It's used by communities for, for self-medication. Uh, it's used as a pacifier for young children. Uh, the uh, opium uh, addict, or the addiction rate to opium in Afghanistan is extremely high. Uh, you will hear different figures quoted all over. Uh, I'm not going to quote any of those because I don't know what the sources are or how valuable those are, but uh, it, it, some of the numbers I've heard are really scary to understand the number of people in Afghanistan that may be addicted to, to opium products at some level or another. It's a real problem. Uh, questions about opium? It's just a little bit. There are going to be some more discussed, and, and it's been my experience in these classes that there's always lots of questions about opium production and poppy. It's a good product for us to talk about, to think about how
crops are grown, what do they need, why do they produce, why does that value chain work so well when some of the other value chains don't, or what are some things we can learn from that value chain that we can apply to others. So it's a good model for us to think about and compare. So, but if you find the right systems, they will work in Afghanistan, they'll work effectively. So it's a matter of let's make sure that we apply the right uh, levers to these value chains to make them work effectively. Okay? All right. Another really, really important topic. Um, everything in Afghanistan agriculture depends on water. Uh, you can't overemphasize the importance of water. If you have water, uh, in most parts of Afghanistan, you can produce crops. In many parts of Afghanistan, if you don't have access to irrigation, you're really uh, gambling whether or not you're going to be able to produce a crop. Some areas, if you remember, we looked at the map earlier across the north, you see rain-fed areas that can produce uh, wheat and uh, other crops on a pretty dependable basis, uh, but that's about the only area in Afghanistan. Not many places in the south would you see any production. I know all of, all of you that have been to Afghanistan before, you've flown over, uh, and when you fly over, you're always looking down at the green areas and brown areas. Think about this. The green areas have access to irrigation and water. The brown areas do not. Some of those are as simple as a farmer right here, the farmer on the line over there does not have access and they, they can't produce anything. This farmer here has plenty. Uh, it, water is a source of life. It's also a source of a lot of conflict. So. Uh, within local communities, there's a lot of conflict over water. There's a lot of water threat theft. Uh, there's some management of water uh, among farmers is extremely important. So most irrigation systems in Afghanistan are very si simple. Uh, many of us would call them primitive, uh, but they're also uh, the same, some of the same technologies that are operating right here in the Central Valley. Uh, something I forgot to mention earlier, if you're here in Fresno area, and you're going to be here for a little time, you have a little opportunity to get out, go to a farm market. Every time I come out here, there's a different crop that's coming in. The crops that you see in this area are the same kinds of crops you see in Afghanistan. Uh, with, and you will be able to see how the farm markets are operating, look at what's going on at a given time, be aware that what, what's, what are they planting now, what are they harvesting now, how does that cropping system work. Uh, look at the irrigation canals as you cross over, wonder where they go, uh, look at how the water gets into the crops. You'll see a lot more drip irrigation you'll see, um, here than you'll see in Afghanistan. You'll see a lot more flood irrigation over there. You'll also see flood irrigation here. Uh, it's a very common practice still in the Central Valley. Uh, but, but think about that. Um, but if you look at this right here, you see water coming through and you see, uh, you see water flowing here, no water flowing over here. You essentially take a shovel uh, fill up one side, make a dam, open up the other side, and let the water flow through. You just turn the water from one place to another. Uh, you'll, have, uh, uh, you'll have someone called a mirab, who we'll, you'll hear some more about later. But it's described to me as a water mayor, as somebody within the community, an elder who helps make decisions about who gets water and when. And that person's job is to kind of allocate that out. Uh, you'll also see water disputes coming to the Dale office at the provincial level. Uh, they'll walk into the director if they want to go see the director and talk about uh, uh, water conflicts. Uh, so they're looking for people to uh, uh, kind of have some kind of a negotiation to negotiate out those conflicts. They're also looking for infrastructure to add more infrastructure, be able to add more land under irrigation. And those are some of the big challenges. Um, But we're going to have, you're going to have uh, more conversation about water. You're going to have a presentation after mine is going to be talking about irrigation specifically. So uh, you'll ha have a lot more opportunity to talk about water. Okay? Ag credit systems. These are all different parts of that value chain we talked about. Uh, we're going to get more information on this, but um, most credit come from uh, the landowner or wealthy businessman. Somebody mentioned here this morning that um, inputs to a farmer may come from the landowner. That may be a wealthy landowner, or, or, and they may be sharecropping, working on a, uh, cropping a farm for a landowner uh, that's supplying them with financing. Uh, Afghan banks, there, is, uh, there are Afghan banks who provide financing and are doing that in a way that is Sharia law compliant. 
so that the banks are making some money uh, and are able to pay for their costs. There are also money traders uh, that will help finance, uh, and there's also uh, the most popular thing you hear about lately is uh, microfinance. You know, a very small loan can make a big difference to an Afghan farmer. If they need a, a key piece of equipment or a key input that they can't get access to, if they can get access to a little bit of financing, you know, a hundred dollars, a couple of hundred dollars, it can make a huge difference in their ability to produce uh, the crops. Uh, but the uh, World Aid Organization of Consumer Credit Unions, USAID, World Bank, uh, uh, the British, um, the average loan from a microfinance loan is about $700. There is uh, a credit program that is funded by USAID that's operated out of the Ministry of Agriculture uh, that makes large loans to cooperatives, but they have to be groups of farmers in order to participate in those loans. Those loans are really large loans. Um, they're telling us so far, that program just got started about a year ago. They're telling us so far that program is uh, doing very well. They have 100% uh, repayment on loans. None of those loans are in default. So it's off to a really good start. Um, so we're anxious to see how successful that's going to be. But ag credit, it continues to be one of the major limiting factors for farmers to be able to have uh, produce uh, crops at their optimum level in Afghanistan. Uh, we take this for granted because agriculture credit is so available here. You can get it from commercial banks. Uh, you've got ag credit systems that operate in different regions of the country. Uh, credit has not been nearly the challenge here as it would be in Afghanistan. So things that we take for granted here that we can get, well, we'll just go buy a tractor. Well, a far farmer in Afghanistan, there's no way they can just go buy a tractor. Uh, they simply don't have the financing, the ability to get the capital to be able to buy a, um, a new piece of equipment like that. Okay, levels of technology. Um, when you're thinking about different types of technologies, uh, think about planting, fertilization, pest management, irrigation, mechanical, livestock. These are, what are some of the appropriate technologies in Afghanistan? Uh, if you're, we talked about uh, animal traction earlier. They're also, they may have access to farmers to till land in the early, early part of the year. What are some other ways uh, that may, some other technologies that may be used to help farmers that may be appropriate to Afghanistan? Some of you come up with some examples? What's that? The Kares system. The Kares system. systems are an irrigation system, which you're going to hear a lot more about in a little bit. But... Uh, uh, but redeveloping those caresses, uh, putting some technologies in there. So then you're talking about uh, need for some type of infrastructure, uh, things like water pumps. Uh, you're going to hear some things about uh, water pumps and systems for water pumps. If you have a water pump, how are you going to run that water pump? What do you need to run a water pump? If you have a well, for example. A hand crank? A hand crank. Pretty simple. Uh, we too often decide, hey, we've got to have a pump, we need to break some Stratton engine or something like that to operate that, then you've got to have fuel, may or may not be any fuel available, may not be any money to buy fuel, uh, there may not be any maintenance for those, uh, those uh, engines. Um, one of the things that we find with pumps is they pump too fast and can collapse the sides of the wells and ruin the well forever. So there's some, you have to think about what is the appropriate technology for a given area. Well, uh, how many of you are familiar with artificial insemination? Some of you? Artificial insemination is uh, using semen from a, you know, an improved, species, an improved uh, genotype or phenotype of an animal. Uh, like, you know, every, give you cows for example or sheep for example, the ram or the bull is half the genetics of the whole herd. So if you can get really improved genetics, from the male side of a cross, then you can make a really big difference. Is that appropriate in Afghanistan? No? Absolutely, very, very good point. Are there animals that are available and adapted to that kind of climate?
yeah, there are there are improved um, livestock lines from sheep, uh, cattle from other places as well that are adapted to that kind of a climate. Uh, went to give you this is an example for, for the big aha moment for me. I go into a, a district center with uh, an agribusiness development team in Nangahar Province. Um, some, the Dale director was there meeting with some farmers at the time we got there, so we had a really good opportunity to visit with them. I walk in and on the wall is a picture of a Holstein bull and with uh, his name and his, all the numbers that tell you uh, what are the kinds of uh, uh, traits that he's going to help improve within the herd. Uh, right there on the wall with uh, where, how do you order the semen for that bull. It's, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I'm working in places that have no power, they have you know, no, they're really some really big challenges, yet here is one of the technologies that really made a big difference in the United States that's, that's it's a big leap for them, and here it is available to them. Well, I'm sitting in that meeting, and I, the guys from the Missouri ADT introduced me to this guy who works for the ministry, and he is their artificial insemination person. He goes around district to district, artificially inseminating cattle, and particularly cattle, and primarily dairy, uh, to improve the herds. It's something that can make a huge leap in uh, technology, and genetics especially, but it has to be ad adapted to the local community. Uh, but it does exist, it can be effective. I talked to this guy and asked him how, what his effectiveness rate was. He said 100%. Uh, you know, every cow that he breeds gets pregnant. I said, well, we need to bring you to the United States because I don't know anybody in the United States that gets 100%. So, uh, but what his success rate was, I don't know. But the Missouri ADT told me they'd been to district centers when he was there inseminating cows, and there'd be a line of them down the street uh, just waiting to bring the cows to, uh, to, to be bred. And really interesting. I don't know how effective that is, but I know it's an active, pro active practice that's taking place. Um, other examples that you might have of uh, technology that may have been uh, used in Afghanistan from your experience? I know some of you may not have a lot of experience in agriculture, but yes? Cool storage. So what we did is we had a uh, package of five hundred dollars, a small seal and a small uh, container. Mm -hmm. uh, we're digging into the ground mm -hmm. with a with um, a respirator. A, a vent pipe. A vent on yeah. the top and vent to the side. Mm -hmm. And that brought the temperature to probably about seventy-five degrees. Yeah, makes a big and difference. And went from seven to fifteen days for the product for them uh, to keep it until they could transport it somewhere. So you double the time they could get used to get it from the market. Uh, Sadly, I, I, I just redeployed that during the time that was, him, uh, was running. Yep. So, uh, but that, that's where that's something that actually is yep. a, a good call out. Yep. Cool storage has been really used very effectively in Afghanistan. There's been a tremendous amount of cool storage put in in Bamiyan uh, for potatoes. Uh, but it's been used all across the country. Do you guys know what cool storage is? How many of you know what a root cellar is? That's a root, root cellar that we would think of, those of us, I grew up in Mississippi, so everybody had a root cellar, a place to put your potatoes and store them for the winter, you know, those, all kinds of root, root crops that we would put in there. Uh, that's cool storage. A lot of your canned jars, the things that you canned, you would put them in a cool, dark area. Uh, that's, a, that's cool storage. Uh, but the example you heard here is you double the shelf life in the amount of time it uh, that a farmer had to get that product to market. From Urzgan to Kandahar, transportation is less than ideal, would you say? So getting those things to the market in Kandahar was a real challenge because of transportation. If you could have a few extra days to store it, it meant the difference in having a crop and not having a crop for many of those farmers in Urzgan. It's a really simple technology 
introduced that was very effective. Okay? Technology examples. Okay. Uh, change subjects here a little bit. I want to, uh, one second, and I want to, I want to get us another break in here in a minute, but let's get through a little bit of food security. Um, you, you're going to hear a lot about food security in Afghanistan because it is an important topic. Uh, it's also important to understand this definition. What is food security? Uh, according to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, which is the world's leading authority that we look to for looking at uh, this issue internationally, says food security exists when all people at all times have physical, social, economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. Based on this definition, it's been def uh, estimated that uh, Seventy percent of Afghans. Uh, we're going to get. We're going to talk a little about this in the next slide. But I want you to think about this definition. All people, all times, have access economically to desirable foods. Uh, it's a pretty discriminating definition. So it doesn't necessarily mean people are hungry, but it, it is an important distinction that we need to think about. Uh, Roughly 8 million people in Afghanistan, or 27% of the population, are what we would call chronically food insecure in Afghanistan. That means that every year they grow through periods of time when there is less than enough food or they don't have the right foods uh, for nutritious or, or dietary selection. Uh, the World Food Program has provided some food assistance to more than 6.5 million people in 2010, as an example. Um, United States government and USAID are major contributors uh, to the World Food Program, uh, contributing $53 million in 2011. So our conversation earlier about putting controls on how much of given crops are produced is not an issue in Afghanistan. The issue is not producing enough. The heaviest needs occur from November through May, which is called the lean season or the low season we talked about a little earlier. That's the time of year when crops are not coming off. They really depend on stored crops, stored foods, uh, dried fruits and nuts, uh, things like wheat that they can store and uh, grind into flour to make uh, bread. Um, Jiroa, or the government of the uh, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, uh, utilizes USDA and USAID funded programs to plan and forecast food shortages. Uh, there's a program called FuseNet, which you may run into when you're over there. It's called the Famine Early Warning System. Uh, it is a, a USAID funded program that uh, is intended to forecast when famine may be coming. Uh, they do a really good job of looking at snowfall, snowpack, rainfall, uh, being able to forecast when they're going to have shortages based on drought, ability to get crops into the ground, those kinds of things. It, it's a really effective tool for forecasting uh, when we may see drought or may see uh, food shortage shortages. Uh, some other threats to food security are insecurity in an area. Now that uh, can be a real driver to food security of not, have, not being able to, to move food into a market or into a place where people need it or others. Difficult access to market. We talked about the example of transportation from Erzgan to uh, Kandahar. Erzgan is not a remote province compared to some others, uh, but it still has pretty significant challenges in, in transportation. Um, Poor sanitation is, is a challenge. Uh, uh, keeping food uh, safe for consumption is, is, a, is a major issue that we're continuing to work on. Low education levels, uh, people understanding what, the, what they need to do to have enough food, make sure that they have access to the right kinds of nutritious foods. Um, many Afghans know very little about nutrition uh, and understanding that it's important to have a balanced diet, uh, making sure that you're not just eating all carbohydrates, that you're able to get uh, fiber and protein from different sources are uh, basic education that we take for granted most Afghans uh, may not know about. Uh, drought has been a real challenge. Uh, several years of drought in a row, 2008, 9, 10 were real challenges. Uh, 2011, 2012, really good rainfall. We're going to talk about wheat production to show you the difference a uh, good year can have over a bad. And environmental degradation, loss of soil quality, uh, 
loss of uh, rangeland, water, plants there to help hold water, hold soil, erosion, uh, the environmental de degradation of some of those farms has been pretty dramatic. Uh, uh, another area of overuse of water, uh, having too much uh, salt, or having, uh, especially in some provinces in the south, uh, it's really a challenge in big areas in, uh, in Helmand. Uh, is saline and in in, from the water is salty and once you put it on the soil the water evaporates and the soil is left. You'll actually have white areas on top of the ground. Uh, those of you that may have been to Iraq would see a lot of this. Uh, you see a lot of this in, uh, in Helmand in particular but other provinces have, have a challenge with it as well. Uh, important to note, poppy is one of those crops that you can grow in high saline soils and be successful. There are other crops as well but that's one that also does well. Um, so if you think about that 27% number, 8 million people being chronically food insecure, that's a pretty substantial part of the population. Um, the World Food Program is the main provider of food assistance. Uh, early on, we would have a lot of uh, uh, military groups, uh, NGOs and others that would see food uh, shortage problems and they would put food into the market to help satisfy that problem. Um, I would challenge you to not do that if you're in a position, if you see that happening, don't do that. Work through the World Food Program. They're the one that coordinates that among all the donors. And you may not know it, but there may be food on the way. There may be in, uh, plans to purchase food in the local market to support the local markets or, or others. But just coordinate your, if you see famine uh, or challenges for food shortages coming in a given area, before you act, be sure to talk with the World Food Program, okay? That's an important link to make. Uh, the note that we have is humanitarian assistance from the military directly to the population should only be done as a last resort. Okay? There may be times when it's appropriate, but usually uh, it's not. Okay? Let's see. All right, yeah, here we go. All right, we're going to, this, I've got a few maps here to show you, to give you an idea. And these are, these are from maps from Fusenet, uh, talking about the uh, food security conditions from October to December 2012. Uh, these are the provinces where you would see, these are where many of the chronically food insecure areas are. Uh, so a couple of important notes, things to note about this is, where are those provinces? All right, many of you understand Afghanistan. You know that there's population, big population centers along the ring road. This would be the Central Highlands, and then the uh, um, Hindu Kush Mountains up in Badakhshan in that area. Those are remote. They're hard to get to, not good transportation systems, can have a real impact on whether or not uh, food's able to get in and out. So those are the areas we would think of as chronically food insecure, okay? There's another comment that's often brought up is that food security leads to insecurity uh, within a region. Uh, if you think about these two areas, these are two of the more secure areas in the country at any given time. The Central Highlands and that, uh, that northeast uh, corner there are typically pretty secure areas. So that theory of saying that where they don't have enough food, it's the area you're going to have insecurity, doesn't necessarily fit sometimes. Paul, you were going to say something? I'm just going to jump in, guys. When you have a chance, you can almost correlate the food insecurity to the, the topographical right. area. Yep. Uh, high, high mountain areas. Lack of water so is the, I think, is the key short thing. Short growing season. Short growing season, lack of water, lack of transportation ability. Uh, those are a real challenge in those areas. So that kind of leads to some of the food insecurity. But uh, correlating f food insecurity with uh, insecurity within a region is not, not a link you can always make. Maybe it may have some merit, but it may not. Um, these are what we would call some transitionary food insecure provinces um, across the north up there. If you remember the map I showed you earlier and talked about the arable land, you'll know that that top area up there was the area that's really impacted by uh, rainfall. That's where the rain-fed crops are grown. Uh, if you have a drought in those areas, uh, you have real challenges um, in producing 
uh, uh, enough food for the population in those areas. Those provinces on the east in the darker yellow color, uh, those are areas where there's less developed irrigation systems. Uh, so there's not as much water in some of those areas. You'll have low cultivation, there's not as much farmland in some of those valleys as well. It's a lot, it's a lot of mountains, uh, sometimes it's uh, not easy to get around in, uh, but it really it's, that's limited irrigation in low cultivation areas. Uh, the red areas uh, are population centers. You know, most of you know that. You've got uh, Kabul, Kandahar, Herat, uh, Mazar, Kunduz. Those are population centers where there's just more people there than crops are produced. So you have to have crops brought into those areas. So if you have limited transportation, uh, if you can't move in and out of those, some of those cities for a, a while, you could have cities that have, uh, a, uh, have some food ins insecurity issues. Okay? Wheat is by far the largest crop in Afghanistan. You see production here. And these production numbers, I think, are 2011-2012 numbers. Or, uh, and that's about, would be about four million metric tons of wheat were produced in those years. And that was a drought year. We're gonna talk a little bit about some other numbers in a second. But you, rice, barley, corn, those grains are really important crops. Uh, in volume of production. This is not dollars of production. Uh, potatoes, grapes, raisins, cotton, opium. So you see the amount of volume produced, opium is very, very small. But dollar values, that would flip around a lot. But uh, the, what I want you to get from this is I want you to understand how important wheat is to Afghanistan. Okay. Wheat is the primary food source in Afghanistan. Uh, wheat flour consumption by Afghans is estimated to be 180 kilograms, or 400 pounds per person per year. So if you would equate that, that would be like eating uh, over a pound of wheat a day per person. And you know how much bread you can make from a pound of wheat? So it's a lot of carbohydrates and a little bit of protein but mostly carbohydrates. So it's an extremely important part of that, their diet. Uh, of course, the wheat crop is highly dependent on, uh, on rainfall and, and snowfall during the winter season because it grows as a winter crop. Um, Afghanistan does not produce enough wheat to feed itself. Uh, even in a bumper crop year, uh, like uh, 2012 to 2013 was the harvest year from last summer, essentially. Uh, they did not produce enough wheat to feed themselves. And that was the year when there was heavy rainfall and heavy snowfall, there was plenty of water. Uh, some of the wheat deficits made up uh, from uh, regional trading partners, primarily Pakistan and Kazakhstan, uh, is where their wheat is purchased in the regional uh, market locally. Uh, so th those are uh, countries that produce more than they consume, so they can sell locally to Afghanistan. I know we talked earlier about crop calendars. And this is, uh, I know there's a lot of colors and lines up there, and I know you can't see that very well. You do have copies of this in your packet. But what I want you to understand is that if you look at uh, Farad, Farad uh, up at the top and go down to, say, to the south, uh, say, in Pactia Coast, uh, you will see the, where the planting season, well, I can't see that very well, I'm too close to it. You have field preparation time in the brown over there, then you go to the yellow in the uh, sowing, emergence, uh, and then you get into the mid-season, and then it goes into flowering, grain field, and harvest. So you look at uh, in Farah, the planting season starts in August, September. Uh, if you look at other parts of the country, you'll see uh, planting season doesn't start until October. So depending on where you are, that planting season, harvest season, can move quite a bit uh, based on uh, climate conditions. Uh, so it can have a real impact on other things that you may be doing. So it's important to understand what the crop calendar is where you are. Uh, the other thing I want you to understand is there's a lot of variance from different places. So 
just because it's harvest season, season in one area doesn't mean it's necessarily harvest season in another. Uh, when you quote something on Afghanistan as a whole, you can understand it's a very diverse place, it may not, may not hold water. Um, you often hear on a national level that this magical date of having the crop in and uh, wheat in by October 15th is an important date. Uh, timing of, of planting is very important. If you plant too early or too late in Afghanistan or anywhere, it's even here in the United States, it's gonna have a dramatic impact on your production. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a dry year, a wet year, or a hot year, a cold year, it really doesn't matter. Uh, it's going to have an impact. Uh, you, you can be a couple of weeks late, and you can have 20, 30% reduction in the amount of wheat produced. The same is true for some other crops. But just to understand that there are different cropping calendars for different areas. Um, major wheat uh, surplus and deficit producing areas. Uh, across the green, green across the top is those rain fed areas. In a given average year, you'll see that's a heavy, uh, def heavy uh, surplus area. Uh, then you'll see the, the green, the lighter green are also surplus areas. Uh, then you go into the yellow, brown, and red as deficit areas. Why do you think those red provinces are so deficit? Population, Population centers. That's where huge numbers of people live, and they, they may produce a lot of wheat there. They just simply don't produce enough to feed the population in that province. So where would people in Kandahar get their wheat? Where? Hellman? They have a little bit, but they're not enough in Hellman to, produce, to feed uh, Pakistan. Pakistan. Why wouldn't they just get it from the north where there's a lot of extra? Why? What was that? Proximity. Proximity? Yeah, for those of you that have been to Afghanistan, you understand that transportation to be able to move wheat all the way from Balk province down to Kandahar is a real challenge. But it's not very far to go right across into to Pakistan and be able to, to purchase wheat. So uh, for also the wheat in the north may get sold. Some of it may make its way down to Kabul and other areas, but it also may be sold uh, across into uh, uh, countries to the north. So another example of even in Afghanistan, you're dealing with a global market. Everything does not exist within a vacuum. The wheat situation, 2011-2012, uh, wheat crop declined significantly because of the, the drought had. had uh, they estimated that wheat production of uh, 2.1 million tons, that was down 1.2 million tons, or 33% from the previous year. But in 2012-2013, the wheat harvest was, almost, was about 6.7 mi million metric tons of wheat. That's a tremendous change from one year to the next and Afghanistan's ability to feed itself with wheat. But even 6.7 million tons is one of the highest, uh, if not the highest year on record, uh, but certainly the highest production level in like the last 20, 30 years. Uh, but even at 6.7 million tons, they were only 94% self-sufficient. So there's no reason that we, that's a, we would not want to put any controls on how much wheat was produced. That was back to your question earlier. Uh, we want to see them produce more wheat, be able to produce enough wheat to feed themselves. Um, primary reason for the wheat harvest was favorable weather conditions. Uh, those of you that were over there in uh, late 2011 through the winter of 2012, uh, you know that there was a lot of snowfall that year. There was a lot of rainfall through the spring. Uh, so it was great growing conditions for wheat. I like to say that it was because I was over there the year that I was advising them as the year wheat production went up that much. but. I can't take all the credit for that. All right. Um, wheat production volatility. You'll see that wheat does go up and down for a number of different reasons. Uh, 2001, 2002, you really started to see it go up in 2003. And you do, we do see a trend of wheat production going up. If you look at the line uh, from like 1.5 million metric tons, it is, it is going up. Um, why is that? There's a lot of different reasons we could give you. You know, better infrastructure for water, better uh, security in the areas, uh, more incentive to uh, uh, farmers feel safer and be able to plant crops. 
a lot of different reasons. It uh, could be that they're using better varieties, um, better farm inputs, all of those different things that we talked about in the value chain that we've been working on to increase uh, agriculture income and jobs. Uh, but uh, if you looked at another thing to note is this year, or the 2012-2013 year, number that it would be way up here, like 6.7 million metric tons. That goes to 4.5. So you can see how much in change that one year had simply because you had favorable weather conditions. All right. Questions about agriculture in Afghanistan? Yep. This is to give you kind of a, a very broad view of what agriculture is, and you're going to be able to really drill down in some of these topics, some of the topics that are really going to be important to you. So uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Many times you're going to be able to get those questions answered later, but we want you to see how things are interdependent uh, across agriculture through this presentation. Uh, and as you are work out working on some of the field exercises or other things, think about the other things that the work that you do with livestock may impact the uh, vegetable production and vice versa. So all those are important. I want to talk a little to you a little bit about uh, some of our the development strategy, especially for U U.S. government programs, uh, which does include military, USAID, USDA, and others that may be working in agriculture. Um, some of the players. A couple of things I want to concepts I want you to get quickly. This is an organizational chart for the Ministry of Agriculture, Irrigation, and Livestock. Uh, I don't expect you to read the boxes and understand what they are. What I want you to understand is there's a lot of people that work in that ministry, a lot of different offices. It's a very complex organization. It's a big bureaucracy. It's a lot like USDA. Sometimes it takes a while to get things done and things don't operate as efficiently as you would like. Okay? Uh, put in, on top of that some of the other challenges that are there, it uh, can create a real uh, challenge to work with. Yes? Uh, are you seeing the same thing where NGOs are uh, pulling the best and brightest from the mall, the mail as well? Yeah, absolutely. That's what I meant earlier. That's where they're, that's where they're pulling them from. Either they're uh, now... Well, even the highest levels. There are some programs to put in place some, uh, to support some of the higher level people with uh, salaries and other things. Uh, a program called Capacity Building for Results. We can talk a lot about those. Uh, um, there, there's some things we're trying to do to remediate some of those problems. Some of those problems are taking care of themselves af as some of the donor dollars leave. So that is going to have some impact. Um, the, day, the structure for the provincial and district level, um, the DALE structure, the DALE stands for the Directorate of Agriculture, Irrigation, and Livestock. You often heard, you'll often hear the director of the Provincial Office of Agriculture called the DALE. And actually, that is a, the, his title is director, and he's director of the DALE. Um, within that provincial office, you'll have a deputy director oftentimes. Sometimes they're called the director of agriculture programs or other things. Uh, they will have issue directors, they have one in livestock, irrigation, land management, cooperatives. They'll have one for extension, one for research. Those are examples. Uh, and it's a district level at the districts within the provinces. You would think of those, you might think of the provinces as states and the districts as counties. Uh, way we might think of it in the United States at the district level. You might have a district lead and then extension agents. Uh, some of those you'll have a number of people, sometimes it'll be one person you will see uh, some, pro some districts won't have anybody working in those areas. Some, some districts will work very effectively. It's a, it varies quite a bit depending on a number of factors. Uh, uh, just to want you to understand that that, how that structure works a little bit. Uh, funding, the, there's a, uh, this is kind of a complex thing that I want to go through with you uh, fairly quickly. Funding and the the government in Afghanistan does not come from the local level, does not come from the provincial level. It comes from the ministry level at the central government through the Ministry of Finance, and it goes down through the uh, 
through the government from the central level. It's a uh, op. It, uh, so if you want, to, if you're looking at uh, provincial projects and those kind of things, they all have. They can't really be started and funded at the local level with dollars. They really have to go back up to the central government, and everything has to come down through that that uh, chain. It creates a real challenge to be able to set priorities and fund things locally, make those decisions because everything has to go back up, be funded through the central ministry, and come down. Um, Dales, the directorates at the provincial level don't receive any program funds. They only receive funds for salaries, maintenance, and operations. Okay? Program funds all are spent at the ministry level. Okay? This is it's a key point if you're trying to work with a provincial office to understand they don't have money for programs. Uh, and in the past, they really have gone to donors, NGOs, uh, looked at SERP funds and other things to fund their programs. Um, to get dollars, they have to submit a proposal to their central ministry, in this case, the Ministry of Agriculture, Irrigation, and Livestock. Uh, then they have to wait for it to be funded, contracted, and implemented from the ministry. They can't purchase those things, can't make those contracts locally. That's why it was so much of a streamlined system for them to be able to work with uh, SERP funds and other types of funds locally because they didn't have to go through all that bureaucracy. Well, in many ways, that was efficient, but it was not effective in building government operations in Afghanistan because once those SERP funds are gone, they've got to find a way to make their system work. And until that system is work, works and they make it work more efficiently, it's going to continue to be a challenge. Um, so they really relied on uh, ADTs, PRTs, USAID, USDA, other so sources of funds. Um, our real focus is really in helping the ministry be more effective. But so making that system work so that they, you have to operate through that system to make sure that uh, they are able to effectively contract and purchase and do the procurement things through the central ministry is really important. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to move on here a little bit. But I want you to see that these are the development priorities in agriculture as they evolved over time. It started off with the Afghan National Development Strategy in 2008. That evolved into the National Agriculture Development Framework in 2009. Uh, 2010, the Kabul Conference was held uh, with the ARD cluster, that's Agriculture and Rural Development, which included the three ministries, uh, Ministry of uh, Irrigation, uh, Ministry of uh, Electric, uh, Energy and Water, MEW, uh, the Ministry of Rural Development and the uh, Ministry of Agriculture were those three in the Agriculture Rural Development Cluster. Uh, they developed their priorities and then the current priorities are looking at coochie policy, uh, water and irrigation, land, farm production and economics, uh, export certification, forestry and capacity building and natural resource management, and uh, change management. So that kind of has their, you see how the priorities have evolved over time. And those priorities have evolved in consultation with donors, international partners, uh, military and civilian. So it's been a pretty broad uh, conversation. And these are the ministry's priorities. And these are the U.S. government's agriculture assistance strategy priorities. We have two goals, basically. I mentioned them earlier. One is to increase the uh, confidence of Afghans in their government. Uh, and we do that by increasing the capacity of the ministry to operate so that it can operate effectively. If the Afghans see their ministry serving their, their needs effectively, they're going to have more confidence in their central government. Uh, the other aspect is to increase agriculture jobs and income. And income. Uh, we can do that many ways. This is one we've been really effective at uh, by putting in infrastructure, making sure that markets are in place. Uh, but Increasing agriculture productivity, getting inputs to farmers, those are things that we can do really effectively, really quickly. The top goal up there, you'll see those, uh, is one that's much more challenging. That's the real focus of our programs the last few years has been on uh, capacity building. Yes? How do you accomplish the second set of goals while still supporting the first? Uh, you continue, we have a number of different development projects that are working on these things, looking at infrastructure development and the others. But we do those through the Afghan government. And many of our programs have shifted from uh, programs where we go out and do infrastructure development or we go out and do these uh, uh, assistance of farmers to on-budget programs where the ministry actually spends those, does that and spends those funds. Of Afghans is, is like the aim, and then the, the second two are tools that are 
available to reach that. So if we're helping build the capability of the Dale, just some of the some of the kind of the hardware tools they have are increasing productivity, uh, regenerating averages. So yeah. These are things that you all can help the Dale to, uh, yeah. to work with. Uh, early on in Afghanistan, the real emphasis was on was on uh, feeding people, producing more, increasing those markets. But as we look toward transition, you know it's important for the Afghans to be able to do this for themselves. So that's when that top goal becomes most important. If you see these written somewhere, you will often see those goals flipped. Uh, we flip these because the emphasis is really on the first goal now. I want you to also understand that the mail has objectives and the U.S. government has objectives. Those objectives, objectives uh, work in tandem. They are, our goals are really built around supporting their goals. So ag production, increasing agricultural productivity, economic regeneration, regenerating agribusiness, et cetera. So those, they do complement each other. There is a system. Um, big things to remember is the Afghan government leads. Uh, agricultural systems will have strong focus on investments in sustainable agricultural growth. Uh, throughout Afghanistan. Um, government involvement in markets should focus on regulation and enabling the private sector. Those are the things we want to see. Uh, projects should be linked to a key value chain where possible. We talked about value chains. It's important that projects are enabling those value chains. Most of our development projects in the, those areas through USAID are all value chain oriented now. Uh, either infrastructure development or value chain oriented and then uh, with Hopefully I'll talk a little bit about some of those in just a second, but agriculture assistance should be uh, demand driven. It means what do the farmers need? What is the demand for these programs? Make it locally based, meeting the needs of the local uh, population, not what somebody from the top sees as a good idea and pushing it out and say, uh, this is what everybody needs. Uh, national level programming is, is required for efforts that focus on regional and national uh, market development. Uh, so if you're working in a local area, make sure that you're understanding that your efforts are tied together with some broader national effort. Okay. Uh, just to understand uh, what some of the interagency structure looks like, uh, Kabul level or national level, you have COM, ISAF, IJC. Uh, the counterpart for that on the, the civilian level is uh, the ambassador, Ambassador Cunningham. Um, then at the RC level, you have the uh, RC East commander is an example of the RC level commanders. Uh, we would have a senior civilian rep on the State Department side. Uh, you may al you'll also probably have USAID, USDA people at that level, but uh, the senior civilian rep would be the, the administrative person. Uh, brigade level, you'd also have the senior civilian representative, some of the smaller uh, at brigade levels. Uh, PRTs, you may have ADTs, of course the ADTs are really phased out, uh, and you may have uh, uh, PRT staff, uh, but as we move forward we have fewer and fewer and fewer people working at the PRT level, and probably by the end of this calendar year, uh, USDA will not have anybody working at the PRT level. Our people will all be at the RC level, regional command level, uh, or in Kabul. Uh, and then at the at district teams, you may have uh, maneuver companies, uh, civil affairs teams, and, and district uh, support teams. But the big thing to look at here, things are pretty regimented at this level. As you get down here, the lines get kind of fuzzy in between. Uh, you see a lot more partnership, cooperation, supporting each other uh, as, as the levels go down. Those of you that have worked in uh, either provincial or district levels would see more and more integration of civilians and and uh, military working together, uh, forming one team that kind of supports a, an area. Or hopefully, in theory, that's where we would be. Uh, some other examples, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, I know their numbers are going down somewhat, too, but they've also done a lot of work with the rehabilitation of management of watersheds, large power and irrigation projects, large infrastructure kinds of projects uh, is what they've done. Uh, typically loaded, located at each RC level. Uh, and they were operating, a lot of their funds were coming from SERP. I don't know how that may have changed uh, just lately, but uh, another important office is the Office of uh, USAID in Afghanistan. They do have a Kabul Office of Agriculture. Uh, they run a portfolio of agriculture development programs. Uh, biggest ones right now that you would think of would be uh, AGRED, which is Agriculture Research and Extension Development Project, uh, IWMP, which is the 
Infrastructure Water Management Program, and then RADIP, which is the Regional Agriculture Development Program. All three of those programs have a significant on-budget portion, which means those funds will be spent through the, the Afghan Ministry. Uh, next, uh, so they also have an Office of Economic Growth. They'll also have an Office of Infra Infrastructure Programs, which may have some uh, interaction with agriculture. <coughs> Department of State, uh, of course, led by the ambassador. They uh, have the traditional embassy staff, plus they have uh, field staff at uh, PRTs and regional commands and, and battalion level. Um, their role has barely been in building governance capacity, providing political context to uh, uh, programs and giving advice to other U.S. agencies, civilian and military, from a political standpoint. I think all of you are probably familiar with the agribusiness development teams, but as those are waning, uh, there only, may only be one or two of those left. I'm not sure. Some of them may know numbers better than I, but uh, we've had a number of agribusiness development teams come through this program and signed up for this program, and then they've pull, been pulling out because they find out they're not going to be deployed after all. So my guess is that those numbers are, it, ones that are there, once they're gone, there may not be any more ADTs. Um, the USDA, um, Office of Agricultural Affairs, is, uh, we have two offices in the, in the embassy in Kabul. Uh, there's one office in uh, uh, Interagency Provincial Affairs, or IPA, but the Office of Agricultural Affairs uh, is the program that runs uh, uh, our development projects and uh, trade programs and other things. That's, that's the traditional office you would see in an embassy. Uh, this, this, when this, this slide says we have 45 officers in country. That's down to around 20 right now. Is that about right, Ryan? 20, yeah. About 20. Uh, then by the end of the year, we estimate there's probably going to be 13, 14. And that's continuing to drop. You see that number's dropping pretty quickly. Uh, Earlier you had the USA down there. You had the several programs designed specifically for agriculture. How do you guys, how does GA and AD markets sync their programs? And how does that work? Um, our programs are designed to work in tandem. They're, they're typically developed together uh, in consultation with each other, in consultation with the Afghans, also in consultation with other donors uh, from other countries. Uh, but our programs are intended to work in synergy. Uh, I can give you and talk about some of those programs. Uh, capacity Building Change Management Program, which Katie is a program officer that, that supervises that program. That program is intended to support the ministry and help it to effectively operate as a bureaucracy or effectively operate as an organiza organization. Uh, so if you don't have a uh, personnel system, system for being a finance, procurement, the ability to hire people, the ability to pay people, the ability to purchase things, you can't operate. And those things really didn't exist very well before the Capacity Building Change Management Program. So their job has been to support that. A second phase of that program is to uh, support the technical directors to make sure that they're able to provide services to farmers. Uh, we have other programs that are, are capacity building to teach them technologies that they can use to serve farmers uh, and those kind of things. The uh, AgRed program from USAID is intended on to build on top of those and expand those out to further, further different places. Uh, they want to expand. We're working in seven different provinces with the central programs and have some people in every province, but uh, you, the AgRed program is intended to push those uh, programs out to 50 different districts beyond that. Um, the water management program and uh, let's see, the, the RADIP program are value chain programs that really build on some of those things. So they are, they're built in consultation with each other. Uh, we, we've had as many as uh, 65 people working in the country, uh, most of those being people working in the PRT level, providing uh, technical services for uh, Americans and Afghans. A lot of training, a lot of capacity building for Afghan colleagues. Uh, other non-U.S. government partners, there's a lot of different donors over there, a lot of different NGOs, a lot of funding sources. Uh, these are some of the NGOs, some of the other uh, donor organizations uh, around the world that are, are providing programs. There is some donor coordination, uh, not as good as I think most of us would like to see, 
but uh, there is a system for, co for uh, coordinating all those efforts to make sure that there's not duplication. Um, there is some duplication, have would have to be with that many programs going on over there, but it, it does work. Um, the contact information for USDA, this is uh, Ryan Brewster. Ryan actually runs the ADAPT program as one of his programs. Uh, then I've got my contact information I can provide to you as well. Uh, if you want my contact information, you'll see Ryan's email address up there. My contact information is Danny, it's spelled D-A-N-E-Y, dot Jackson, at F-A-S dot U-S-D-A dot gov. I'm two minutes over, Ron. So. I, I, will, I will be here all day today. I am flying back tomorrow because uh, Katie's out of the office, Ryan's out of the office, and I need to get back to the office. Katie will be here all week. Uh, Katie can, can talk to you about all of our, uh, our programs. Ryan works in the Office of Foreign Service Operations, and he can talk to you about the field advisors. So you've got two good USDA resources back here who are actually participating as participants in the class, but they can also talk to you about our programs, what we're trying to do, what we've accomplished to this standpoint. So. Dean, you Good resource. Join us for the taste of Afghanistan. Yeah, I'll be here. I'll, I'll be here tonight. Okay. Uh, and I, one of the things I encourage you to do, you've got a number of people here that have worked in Afghanistan, have a tremendous amount of experience. Pick our brains, use us. Uh, even when you get over there, remember our email addresses and our contacts. If you need to contact us, ask questions. We can, if we don't know the answer, we can probably link you to somebody that can, can get it. Okay. Thank you very much. I wish you all uh, success and luck in your uh, deployments and uh, come back safe and make a big difference while you're over there. Thanks.